OK. So uh, I'm afraid I've prepared a sort of much more boring presentation than previous speakers. I feel a bit uneasy that I'm going to show you a long list of maps. Uh, I would add uh, that uh, I, I don't mind at all if you interrupt for short questions. Uh, if something is not clear, I think that with a short question, it's possible to uh, explain better what is the meaning of what I'm showing on the slides. Please don't hesitate to interrupt. I will try to check with the audience whether anyone is raising his, her hands. OK, so that's the plan. It will be difficult, I expect, not to move from this point. Uh, this is the plan of uh, the talk. It is split into three parts. So first is not really climate, strictly speaking, but it is motivations why climate is an important social, economical issues affecting society, human beings, and the environment, and why we should worry about that. On a different perspective with respect to Campi Flegrei, but still we should worry and be concerned about the changes that we are going to um, produce on the environment. The second, it is a description of what is the climate of the Mediterranean region. And Technically, we should make a clear distinction between Mediterranean climate and climate of a Mediterranean region. What is the Mediterranean region is not really a well-precise concept, but I would say that it is more or less what it is within the ellipse in, in, this, in this map. Uh, and finally, what worries and concerns very often also the public debate, which is future evolution, what is going to happen next. So part first. Uh, it is a short review showing you some key slides on why we should be concerned and aware that there are problems society might be challenged to face in the future. Water. Water is a key issue water availability for the Mediterranean environment. Water is a very important resource. It's a richness. We heard about salt, but water is maybe more important than salt. And water has always been, and it is even now, a scarce resource in many, in many uh, of the countries uh, surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. So you see Mediterranean region, it is because it is the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea is a great uh, unifying environmental component that leads us to the, to the talking about the climate of the Mediterranean region. Here, the areas are the watershed, the river basins with the mouth in the Mediterranean. And the level of, of colors, apart here where there is no data, but actually in spite of not having data, they will not much more different from the surrounding colors, tells you the level of water availability pro capita per person. And these colors here, 1000, is more or less the level that is used for characterizing water scarcity. And it's the present picture. So present picture is that large fraction of, uh, of the Mediterranean countries, especially in the south, but also the coast of Spain, are already now affected by water shortage problems. For each slide, when I think it is important, I have a pop-up saying what is the main issue I want to highlight with that slide. Here it is population dynamics. And in population dynamics, you can see a quite clear, two, two clear divides. One, it is west to east. Population is stable or increasing in the west, is decreasing on the east, and north to south. With population that is increasing in the south and stable substantially <coughs> in Central European uh, in northern Mediterranean countries. If you, if you match that with the previous picture, you will see that water stress is going to be even larger for southern Mediterranean countries in the future. 
So population growth will further stress the system. Potential vulnerability. Here, the map is not reaching. By the way, all these maps, you can download them from, from this very nice uh, resource. Uh, here, the, the, the map is not capable of covering the whole Mediterranean coastline. And this is already an issue. Uh, all the southern and Middle East part of the Mediterranean uh, is chronically experiencing a lack of information. Lack of information at various levels. It is also lack of information on precipitation and temperature trends. So what is going on on that countries, it is uh, known to a much lower level than what it is known in the southern part. But also, also in the northern part. Well, also northern part, in many areas, they are actually potentially vulnerable to, to climate change. Vulnerability is different depending on where you are looking at. So uh, I, I haven't actually checked in detail the reason for this map, but in, in this central part, probably will be water shortages, future water shortages that are going to change agriculture to put eventually stress on uh, resources during summer season, when also some of those areas experience a very large uh, touristic inflow. In others, like here, okay, I am from Venice, so I am familiar with the situation. Uh, it's working in the south of Italy, but uh, here, but originally born here. Um, it is sea level rise with very low um, coastal regions. Uh, actually, actually, part of these regions are already below sea level. Now, you can live below sea level, okay, but you need some structural um, some structural measures to face that. Others, others can be change of temperature, so a dramatic change of cover or snow cover during winter. So potential vulnerability is high. And potential vulnerability, that's subjective estimate, will be much higher if you look to the part that is out of a map here. Uh, an example of, uh, of, of uh, how this map is built. These are olives, typical Mediterranean uh, crop, okay? And this is uh, where now, presently, you can grow olives, okay? And it is a typical Mediterranean country, so the whole coastline, the whole coastline, it's uh, actually suitable for olives, to grow olives. And if you move inland, or if you move north, of course, you can still have olive trees, but your crops yield will be much lower, or you substantially can't do it at all. But in the future, this is going to change. So uh, it is, in some places, might become unsuitable because water resources are decreasing. But the real issue it is that places that are now not suitable will become suitable. So this is going to pose a problem in a global world, whether how much profitable will be for those economies to continue to rely so heavily on, uh, on, uh, on olive crops. And you might think, are we ready for that? It is a very difficult question. And again, you see that this map is incapable of covering the southern Mediterranean countries. Now, what is this map? is the fraction of GDP that you put on research. Uh, and you know the target is 3%. You can see that most of the countries around the Mediterranean, they don't reach the 3% target. And it is worse than that, because if you compare with GDP or other central areas, the GDP of those countries is much lower than the GDP of, of, of a Central European countries. So you have a lower fraction of resources devoted to research on top of a lower GDP. So it's just to say that uh, technical readiness to face climate change may be not as high as you would expect, even within Europe. And here I am going to climate. 
So that, those are the motivations why I think we think there is a widespread concern on climate change issues at different levels, on different scales. But now I'm going to talk about real climate and uh, some uh, describing what is the climate of the region. And there are some, some questions. Is the climate of the region uniform? I mean, is this is a picture of a wild, uniform climate with sunny, pleasant uh, summers? Is it really real? Or, I mean, it, or does it apply to the whole of the Mediterranean region? From the way I put the question, you might already imagine the answer is no. Uh, so actually, is the climate of the Mediterranean region Mediterranean? I, I will show you that it is just for a fraction of it, it is Mediterranean. And it is a mild climate. Well, it depends on what you mean by mild climate, OK? But you do have very severe storms in the Mediterranean. I will, I will describe this a bit. And finally, have changes being observed? Yes, changes are being observed, especially for temperature. So why do I show you this picture? Because Mediterranean is a complicated region. And one of the problems that we are describing it, it is resolution. It is a well-known problem. It is, from some aspect, trivial. You always heard it uh, mentioned in scientific debates. But it is really an issue. Uh, you know, very often, I could, I, I could eventually have started now, let me say one thing first. What I'm showing here, I'm showing the orography, the level. So let's concentrate here. Here we have the sea, negative values, different depth. And around it, we have a land with different elevations. And this is computed aggregating data on cells. So here, cells are very um, small. So you can recognize very well the different landscape, the different morphology of Mediterranean regions. Alps, Pyrenees, Apennines, Atlas, and so on. Here, the cells are large, 2.5 degrees wide. Okay? Why, why am I making this choice? Because, for instance, this choice is what was used by global climate models uh, for the first decade of the 21st century say, a, 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 a climate uh, um, uh, a, a assessment done in 2008 would have been based at global scale on this sort of data. So this is what the models see at that time when they were measuring Mediterranean region. And this is what global models see now. And this is eventually even finer than that what regional models see now. Okay, so it is an issue because if I ever be starting my presentation like this, I think it will be very hard to guess that I was going to describe the Mediterranean region. So this is an issue. Uh, and let's look here about climate. So here we have average map of temperature. Here average map of precipitation. So here are millimeter per season, and here are degree Celsius. And here you have the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, autumn. Winter, spring, summer, autumn. OK? So you can see how diversified is the landscape. This is based on, uh, on uh, observations, meaning that uh, there are collection of meteorological observations with different lengths. And it is a complicated procedure by which they are reduced to a common homogeneous data set. And out of data set, you extract the behavior over land. Because you know, to measure anything over sea is much more complicated. It is quite complicated to have a permanent meteorological observation over sea. It is done, but it's something that I'm not going to address during this presentation. So it is clear, compare winter to summer, there is a very strong annual cycle of temperature. Saying one trivial thing, summer are much warmer than winter. And there is even eventually a larger cycle of precipitation, especially in the central part, which is becoming substantially dry during summer. You see 
hardly any precipitation or little precipitation. And is receiving most of water that is then used, so to say, by the environment or by human beings during the rest of the year during the cold season. But you also can see a difference that let's look to the Alps or the northern part of Italy. Is it Mediterranean? Well, you we are coming back to the first discussion. I mean, certainly rivers over there, large fraction of them are ending in the Mediterranean. Okay, so I will defend that it's part of the Mediterranean region landscape. If you look here, it is the opposite situation. Water resources are eventually larger in summer than in winter, but over the top, there is a uniform availability of water resources. So you can see that the way in which eventually these different areas within the Mediterranean are going to face climate change and climate, uh, are, will be different because the environment it is different. Uh, uh, by the way, look, and it is a very critical point, in summer how arid is most of the Mediterranean region. So, you know, modelers and, uh, and uh, climatologists with a dynamical approach to climate are generally very happy with, with uh, temperature and precipitation maps, as I've been showing you before. But there was a, a, a German scientist, Köppen, that uh, has developed a different qualitative classification of climate. Okay? Uh, it is not what a directly a model, a climate model, would compute, but it's very useful and it is becoming increasingly popular now because it provides you a qualitative and uh, um, holistic, so to say, representation of climate. And the distinction it is between tropical, arid, temperate, and cold climates. And what technically is called Mediterranean climate would be the land. A temperate climate with a dry summer, which can eventually be hot or warm. And this classification is based on objective value. For example, temperate, it means that you never go in the winter below freezing. Uh, this is very useful because it characterizes from the perception point of view the environment. So here it is temperate and it is the typical Mediterranean climate. It is a mild climate. Winters are never that cold. And there is a clear seasonality in the availability of precipitation. Summers are dry, winters are wet. You might, I mean, now, for instance, I'm taking Apulia, the middle of the Mediterranean, the place where my institution is located. And precipitation in Apulia is not actually that low on an annual scale. It is 600 millimeters. So it's not much different from many areas in Central and Northern Europe. It is the distribution across the year which is much different. So when during summer evapotranspiration is very high because it is hot weather, a lot of insulation, there is no water resources available for compensating for it. And the landscape will become very dry. So that's the, but then you can have a temperate climate without a dry season. Okay, very from if you are a plant, a very pleasant environment where to live. Not nice for vacation, but very nice for many crops. And then you can also have arid climate, sometimes where the threshold is, is lower than some given uh, reference value, which also depends eventually on, on the temperature. And then you can have cold climate, which can have hot or warm summer, and uh, I am marketing without dry seasons because the types that I am reporting, marking in this list, it is what you get within the Mediterranean regions, all of them. So within a short distance, if you go north to south, you are coming from the cold climate to a temperate climate without a dry season, to the Mediterranean climate and to the arid climate. This very strong environmental gradient, of course, within a very, very small 
a very, very small distance. Small, small on global scale, 1,500 kilometers. And just to make clear, the Mediterranean climate, it is here. C, temperate, S, summer, and uh, precipitation in the summer season. And summer can be either hot or warm. And then it is just this part here. So large fraction of Italy, large fraction of the Balkan Peninsula, they don't have Mediterranean climate. Northern part of Iberia is not really Mediterranean climate apart from the coastline. And large fraction of African coast, they are arid climate, not Mediterranean climate. OK, so that's the big point. We're dealing with something that is complicated from the morphological point of view. Just a very, very short anticipation of what uh, Philippe Drobink is going to talk next. It is intense precipitation event. Precipitation events can be very spectacular in the Mediterranean region. Okay? I am talking about uh, severe convective weather, summer thunderstorms, but also cyclones. Okay? Also cyclones. Here you see a map showing where there are each, each dot is a different station. And uh, here it is the value of precipitation corresponding to different so called return times. Turn time is a measure of how often an event is expected to occur. And uh, of course, intense precipitation, these are the value that you expect to reach every five years on average. So we have 20 events like that in a century. And this is every 50 years. You expect to have two events like that in a century. And they, you see they are concentrating along coastlines. What is producing that? Cyclones are producing that. Here it is a, a synodic map, sea level pressure, that is responsible for the intense precipitation events in different parts of the Mediterranean. So for instance, take Marseille. Marseille is generally associated to the presence of the cyclones somewhere here in the Gulf of Biscay, okay? which is producing a strong advection of air that gets very humid while crossing the Mediterranean. And when it reached the coastline, the contrast and eventually the elevation of the coastline forces the air to locally release that humidity in an intense precipitation event. The presence of a cyclone is true almost everywhere. And the location of the cyclone is such that to promote that flux of moisture against the coastline. So for instance, here it is Brindisi. Okay? And here, the, 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 the cyclone will, will actually produce the advection of moisture, extracting it from the Ionian Sea. Moving to different locations, let's take uh, Larnaca, okay, Cyprus. There, the cyclone will be located in the Levantine point of the Mediterranean. So cyclones are really a key features leading to precipitation in the Mediterranean. They're essential for providing water to the, to, the, to the land surrounding the Mediterranean. So in the Mediterranean, there is nice weather and bad weather. Nice weather, it means sunny, but weather, it means rainy. Well, that's a perspective, OK? It is a touristic perspective. But from many other environmental issues, cyclones and rainy days are a very positive condition. Well, cyclones. This is, again, this is the reference to the initial statement, whether the Mediterranean is a mild uh, region of the world or a stormy region of the world. Well, Mediterranean cyclones are certainly different in size and depth with respect to Atlantic cyclones. They are smaller and less deeper. But this doesn't shouldn't hide the fact that this is an estimate, but around more than 200 cyclones cross the Mediterranean every year, which is about 7.5% of a cycle of the Northern Hemisphere. And if you take the area here, that's about 3 to 4% of the area of the Northern Hemisphere. So actually, the density of cyclones in the Mediterranean is much higher than average. And in fact, 
climatology meteorologists refer to the so-called storm track, the track along which cyclones move uh, 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 around the globe. They tend to have some preferred paths they follow, all of them. A Mediterranean storm track is one of the characteristic feature. Colors here tells you the density of the tracks. So red, purple, color are meant to suggest to you that there is a track along which cyclones are moving from the north and west to the Levantine basis. And another branch is moving from south of the Atlas Mountains, okay, entering in the central part of the Mediterranean. Where are cyclones moving a lot of those tracks coming from? I, I don't know whether it is a surprise or not, N not probably to you if you are familiar with meteorology, but a, a, really a tiny fraction, 10%, is getting inside the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. Most of them are internally generated. And the most active region is here in the northwestern Mediterranean, which is the source of cyclones leading to that. So it is a very interesting, peculiar climate, which uh, a very inter intense meteorological events. I, I wouldn't call it really a mild climate. OK, now trends. This is again based on uh, observation, collection of observation, which are apologies, I forgot to put the reference. Climate Research Unit in uh, the UK, they are hosting a large collection of data. They keep on updating them. And uh, thanks to this data archive, it is possible to compute trends. So here we have, similarly to a few slides ago, temperature on the left, precipitation on the right. The four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And those are trends. So for instance, take summer. In the period from, in the second half of the previous century, but if we extend it to present date, it will not change that much. Values will be slightly different but the overall pattern will not change. You have that in this area, we have about 0.5 degrees per decade, which is a very large value, about 5 degrees per century. This is not uniform <coughs> across season. Summer is the most affected. But you see that there is some sort of consistency. Cooling is green there is substantially no green on this area. What's so, the meaning of the lack of color? Lack of color, thank you. Lack of color uh, means that no significant trend is present. I mean, statistically, if you make average over different periods, you will always get different values, just by chance. Okay? The point it is, is this representative of a consolidated, robust, long-time tendency. Where it is white, it is, well, you may compute values and get uh, randomly different numbers, but there is no evidence of a robust, sustained centennial trend. OK? So if you look at temperature, observation tells you the climate has been warming in the past, or, thanks, white, substantially. We can't say that it has changed. Precipitation, a much more scattered plot. You can see, actually, that there is a tendency, especially in winter, to red colors, meaning a decrease of precipitation. But the picture is much less homogeneous than for temperature. OK? I am not a climate change skeptic. OK? So, I will show you in the next lot. I think that climate will change. There are strong indications that Mediterranean climate will become warmer and very likely drier in the future. 
But if you look statistically to the evidence, okay, the evidence is still is present, but is not as strong as for as for the temperature. Uh, when media generally attributes occasional disasters <coughs> to climate change signal, they I, I strongly disagree in many cases. Um, not for heat waves, but when you are look at changes of hydrological cycle. I don't know whether Philip will have a different view during the next talk, but uh, disasters are not produced by climate change, if you refer to hydrological cycle. They are produced by lack of knowledge of present climate, of lack of preparedness, lack, lack of measures, lack of, of uh, uh, adequate measure to face the present climate variability. Because with respect to the climate variability, changes in precipitation are there. They eventually point to a increasing drying condition, right? They increasingly point to some more extreme events, very controversial. But they don't are so large to explain uh, inadequacy of a society to face them. Time is a bit rushing. If the picture is still a bit blurred, not, not, so, not so clear for, for precipitation, it's certainly very clear for temperature and for temperature extremes. So this picture refers to temperature extremes, and uh, uh, it is for uh, different data sets, uh, slightly different representations. Uh, it's for winter and for summer. And they consider two things. The, the, the number of very hot days, their indexes, uh, we can eventually look technically in detail how they are defined. Again, weight areas means not trends, but it is the number of very hot days and the number of very cold nights. Cold nights, hot days, red and blue. The number of cold nights is decreasing, the number of hot days is increasing. That's the main message. And now, what's the future? Our view of the future is based on models. It is always arguable, strong message, eventually some might debate, but it's always arguable to extend a statistical analysis of the future unless you have a very strong physical background for doing it. Okay? Having observed a trend doesn't tell us that the trend will continue unless we have some reason to support this claim. And very often we do have. So statistical analysis is very useful. But what we say about the future is anyway based on a model. Can sometimes be a very simple conceptual model or can be a very sophisticated mathematical model. Models of climate are a complicated issue because you have to solve, so to say, four different steps. The first step is to identify the climate system, which is very complicated. You have a lot of different components. So in principle, in principle, in order to represent climate, you will need a model where you include the whole world with uh, physical component, okay, atmosphere, ocean, biological components, chemical processes, and also land, uh, also the effects due to the biology and the effect due to the uh, human activities, which is not only changing the composition of the atmosphere, but is also changing the um, uh, characteristic of the land surface at different scales. So in principle, you should be able to represent all of it. And you should be able to translate that into mathematical equations. So you need to find out the laws in which you have somewhere 
a derivative with respect to time that tells you that this equation are telling you something about the future. But those are equations. They are useless unless you know how to solve it. It is not as simple equations uh, as uh, we generally learn at school, for which we can analytically, just by brain activity, find out an equation and say how the solution looks like. You need numerical solutions, which is a very complicated process by itself. And you know, the first attempt to make a meteorological prediction was made by Richardson, which is a pioneeristic work, and uh, meteorologists know that when they are uh, at school. And uh, uh, actually, the attempt failed because he was not, I mean, the laws that he wrote were, were OK, but he was not aware of a problem of translating that law to a solution leading across a numerical procedure to something about the future. So this is absolutely not trivial. And finally, and finally, you need sufficient, which is very large, computer power to solve it. Okay? This is not updated. It's the Cray back end of the 80s, which had this very nice, elegant shape. It was the first supercomputer. And it was nicknamed the most expensive sitting room in the world. So if, if you know that, if you are able of solving all these different steps, you eventually can get to a future scenario. Okay? Of course, we don't agree. And there is a controversy always going on within the scientific community. Sources of, of, of controversies are, well, some components of the climate system we actually don't know in which state they are now. So uh, it is like trying to guess a trajectory, but you don't know the initial point of a trajectory. The internal variability of a climate system, well, we know, we all know that uh, weather is different. We have cold summer and, 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 and warm summer, rainy years and dry years. And this irregular sequence of events is part of a climate variability which occurs on different time scale, year to year, decade to decade. So a climate trend is superimposed to this irregular fluctuation. So having a climate trend doesn't tell us accurately what will be the condition of summer in 1950 because of this random fluctuation. Then, you know, scientists are very bright guys, but their capability to translate every natural process into an equation, it's really a problem, and into an equation that uh, can be solved by a numerical model that you can feed into a computer. So our representation of a climate system for several different reasons is inadequate. And finally, you actually don't know even the future path of a forcing, if you assume that it is the main forcing. You know, it is a question of, uh, policies, decisions, and technology. And guessing the technology in 50 years, tech guessing the political status of the world in 50 years is, uh, well, to me, it is impossible. So for all those reasons, there are controversies. But controversies shouldn't hide the fact, I have one minute plus questions or one minute uh, in total? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I take it as a compliment, not to the fact that I should shut up now. <laughs> so here is, here is, is, is uh, the expected change of temperature. And here is our best knowledge of expected change of precipitation. I make a short story. Precipi temperature will go to increase. And particularly in some continental areas in summer, increase at the end of a century is likely to be several degrees. Precipitation is going to decrease. You see brown colors. It's going to increase where it is green. Okay, 
So it's going to eventually increase or change a little in this part here. I always say that it is a very unfair situation. Countries and economies that can already now rely on sufficient amount of water, they will keep on receiving the same amount in form of precipitation or very little change that can eventually easily adapt to. Countries that are already experiencing problems, they will experience larger problems in the future. <coughs> For the, I think I am over with the time. I will skip most of the, of the, of the I think I'm about five slides to the end. But just one thing that I think it is important, the future evolution of climate change. Here it is how it will progress in time. And uh, the, this century has been divided into 20 years period. So you go from the beginning to the end for the different seasons. This is for temperature and this is for precipitation. So the message here, look the period we're experiencing now. What we are experiencing now is a tiny fraction of what eventually climate change is expected to produce in the Mediterranean region. So if people is alarmed now, and sometimes for precipitation, as I said, the concern is not well motivated by the climate change perspective, but it is anyway very little with respect to what we are going to experience in the future. Well, controlling emission is important. It will change a lot of our future if we can uh, uh, globally match or not the two degrees, uh, the two degrees uh, uh, threshold. Uh, are models reliable? Uh, you know, models do have problems, especially for precipitation. But I would say, I don't really remember who said this sentence, but I always like to see to that. All models are wrong by definition. They are uh, an inaccurate representation of reality. Just some of them are useful. Meteorological models for weather prediction are wrong. But this doesn't mean that we don't find them useful and we check every day on, on, the, on our cell phone, on our uh, iPhone, to see what will be the way that they're going to go for the day or the next coming days. The same is here for climate models. They are certainly wrong, but they are telling us our best, they're providing our best knowledge of what we should expect in the future. So they are useful. And I think I will stop here by saying that we can expect warming, but I really don't think that the warming will be the real issue for the Mediterranean with respect to a global scale. The real issue will be water shortage. And here's a summary, final summary. So thank you. <laughs>